This is the world that we are living in now. Is this the world that we want to leave behind? Can hydrogen be the solution? My name is Don Dahlmann and this is Nicole Scott. We are both journalists and experts in the field of mobility and technology. You may have heard people speaking of hydrogen as an alternative energy solution, but what you may not know is that this technology is already being used today. And we have a lot of questions. Like, is a hydrogen society possible? How exactly does it work? How could hydrogen fit in? Is it really green? And what are the problems with hydrogen rolling out? On the road, in a hydrogen-powered car, we will take a journey to speak to entrepreneurs, politicians and to scientists to get a really deep look into hydrogen. One of the reasons that I became so fascinated with hydrogen is that it's not just about mobility. When we look at fossil fuels, there are so many different kinds, like say, natural gas or coal. So when we look at our green revolution, we're going to need multiple sources of green energy. And that's where I think hydrogen can fit in. It attacks so many different verticals like industry, and it's a really good energy storage vehicle. It's clear that we have to change the way we use and produce energy. But is hydrogen really the solution? And where are we at the moment? What I find very, very important is to emphasize that it is not only for climate change that we need to have zero emission cars. It's also for air quality. It's also for health. We have today 7 million people dying every year of air pollution because of the particles that are emitted by internal combustion engines. Climate change is an absolute reality. It's actually really sad when you live it. Um, when you go to Chiang Mai, for example, I was living there for uh, close to two and a half years. I went there for the first time in 2015. And when you landed, you saw a beautiful jungle. I went there this year again in January 2020. And when you landed, you don't see the jungle anymore. You're landing in a cloud of smoke. When you experience climate change, whether the air quality, the rising oceans, creating this whole climate refugee migration, or whether it is the melting of the Arctic, we have a problem here. Climate change is one of our biggest threats. The young generation, they know that just as much as we do. Um, they're listening to the scientists, and I think it's great. I think it's great that they're digging in and they're, they're behind this cause, because it's such an important one. Certainly it's not too late yet. Um, we have ambitious goals that we must achieve, particularly by 2030. Uh, we need to reduce our emissions by 50%, um, but it's possible. And I want to contribute, I want to do my part. Uh, so if we all do a little bit, we can do it. This is the sound of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest atom possible and the most common element in the universe. Hydrogen was given its name by French chemist Antoine Lavoisier in 1783. He was also the guy who named oxygen. When combined with nitrogen, hydrogen is used to make ammonia for fertilizer, 
which helps plants grow. Hydrogen is in fats and oils, and it turns unsaturated fat into saturated fat. Hydrogen is also in rocket fuel that has brought us to the moon. But now, hydrogen might have a new career because it has the potential to solve our energy problems, not only here, but in the rest of the world. We already seen the transition to greener solutions. And some countries even roll out zero emission vehicles on their roads. But in Germany, we also see the rise of hydrogen. The main reason for the comeback of hydrogen is the challenge of climate change, of course. And it's not only the mobility sector, this is the great thing about hydrogen. It's an energy carrier which can be used to decarbonize not only the mobility sector, but also the industry sector, also the heating sector. I believe that hydrogen will play an important role in our future. Hydrogen burns very clean, you only make water and energy. This is probably its number one benefit. Hydrogen has an extremely high energy density, so you can store a lot of energy in, let's say, one kilogram of hydrogen. To be precise, it's 33 kilowatt hours. We don't know any other substance that can hold so much energy per kilogram. Hydrogen sounds like the perfect solution. Uh, just a little bit too good to be true. Because you have to produce hydrogen. Hydrogen is not just water that produces energy. You have actually industrialized production for hydrogen. And right now, one of the biggest problems is that hydrogen is produced with dirty energy like coal. And so it's not actually green. No, you need green energy to produce green hydrogen, not only in Germany here, but also in the rest of the world. We just saw the numbers with the CO2 emission globally, and we saw that there's a lot to replace with hydrogen. So is that possible? And we're going to need hydrogen to attack verticals like steel production or chemical manufacturing. And we're also going to need to heat our homes with it. Yeah, because we're so used to the fact that the energy is just there and, and you just heat your home and whatever you do. But we never think about where the energy is actually coming from. Now, with the climate change and everything and, and the change we use and produce energy, we also have to think about that. So, can we produce green hydrogen? I mean, and what I need to understand is if this green hydrogen can actually replace the way that we've been storing energy in the past in traditional fossil fuels. Producing hydrogen in a green way is going to be its biggest challenge. Hydrogen can be produced by oil companies, distributed, sold by oil companies. So it will not make a financial crisis when we all go to zero emission cars. If you have a constant flow of renewable energy, you can fill up your battery in your car. The efficiency is better because almost all the electricity you put in the battery comes out for the engine. But if you have an intermittent source of renewable energy, like solar, like wind. Sometimes you don't have enough, sometimes you have too much. Germany very often has too much sun and wind together. And uh, they have to pay the consumers to, to use this electricity, otherwise the grid is exploding. At this moment, you can produce hydrogen from your excessive amount of wind or solar energy, you produce hydrogen, and this hydrogen is produced for free. You can use it in a fuel cell for your house, and you can put it in your cars, in your trucks, in your boats, in your airplanes, everywhere.
The history of hydrogen in the mobility sector is older as you may think. In 1839, William Robert Grove of Great Britain's Royal Institution had an idea of reversing electrolysis of water to create electricity. Based on this hypothesis, he developed the first fuel cell producing safe and clean electric energy. Later, in 1939, Francis Bacon of Cambridge University installed this fuel cell into a forklift and successfully conducted a test drive. The first person to invent a fuel cell electric vehicle was Austrian scientist Karl Kordesch in the 1950s. After World War II, he came to America and remodeled a used car into a fuel cell electric vehicle. In the 1960s, American car maker General Motors hired 200 researchers and designed a van based on Kordesch's fuel cell. However, this vehicle could only seat two people in the front, while the back seat was packed with a fuel cell system. Around the same time, active research into hydrogen vehicles was also carried out in Europe. German automaker Daimler-Benz ambitiously released a fuel cell electric bus. Then, in 1999, Benz released a concept car installed with small fuel cells. And Jürgen Schremp, the then CEO of Daimler-Benz, said with confidence. Today, the race to develop the fuel cell car is over. Now, we begin the race to lower the costs. Japan also plays a major part in the history of fuel cell electric vehicle development. Although they were late to the race, compared to American and European car makers, Toyota presented several fuel cell electric vehicles. Now, Japan is following a hydrogen economy roadmap to develop not only passenger cars, but also trucks, buses, and forklifts that uses hydrogen as a fuel. In South Korea, Hyundai Motor Company began making fuel cell electric vehicles about 20 years ago. In 2018, Mercedes released the GLC F-Cell, a fuel cell operated plug-in hybrid. In September 2019, BMW launched Hydrogen Next. In 2020, Toyota released the new Toyota Mirai. So we've spoken to many experts who've explained to us that hydrogen has the potential to lower our carbon footprint. But we've also learned it may not be so easy. Now hydrogen may be the most common element in the universe. But in order to use it in your car or in a truck, you have of course to produce it. Hydrogen is the H2 in the H2O, which is water. And our planet definitely has enough water. Yeah. But separating that H2 from the H2O is not that simple. No, I spoke to Professor Kwasnik. He is a leading expert in the field of hydrogen. And he also raises some concerns on how efficient hydrogen actually is. When I burn hydrogen, only water is produced. That is nice. But there is no hydrogen. I have to produce it first. I can produce hydrogen from natural gas. But then the climate balance is worse than if I burn natural gas directly. I can produce green hydrogen by electrolysis using solar and wind power. It has many losses, but it is climate neutral. It's also very complex and expensive. As the first element on the periodic table, 
you can find hydrogen in a lot of different places. And what you use to make hydrogen is actually extremely important. Brown hydrogen is made through a process called coal gasification, which uses younger brown coal that contains more hydrogen. Gray hydrogen comes from natural gas. Using natural gas to make hydrogen produces harmful emissions like carbon, so if you don't capture it, it pollutes the air. Then we have blue hydrogen, which is also made using natural gas, but they catch and store the carbon. Storing CO2 is expensive and creates new problems, like what to do with the CO2. If hydrogen today is mostly produced by non-renewable energies, then how can we make it green? Green hydrogen made out of renewable energies is the source for endless power for our lives. But to do that, you need something called an electrolyzer. Our electrolyzers today are about the size of a microwave and they have two inputs, electricity and water, and their output is clean, pre-compressed hydrogen. It can be plugged into any energy setup, whether you want to use hydrogen for refueling, whether it is to uh, have it for your um, energy storage for a neighborhood or to create heat as well for district heating, for example, in the Netherlands. We have a variety of use cases um, that are using our electrolyzers. Electrolyzers are not new technology. They exist for over 50 years. And yes, it's that simple. The only thing you need is a renewable energy on one side, then you add water, and then you get hydrogen. But how does an electrolyzer actually work? Green hydrogen can be made through a process called hydrogen electrolysis. You can create reactions in various solutions. This is the electrolytic process and can be used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. There's a machine that does this and it's called the hydrogen electrolyzer. We use hydrogen electrolysis to convert electrical energy and store it into tanks in the form of hydrogen, which can then be transformed later back into electricity. New technologies have made it possible for electrolyzers to get smaller, more efficient, and more cost-friendly. And that's why we're able to produce hydrogen for so many different kinds of purposes now. Yeah, we already explained that you can use hydrogen for boats and planes and trains. You can even power whole cities with it. But the question is, how do you extract the energy from the hydrogen? For that, you'll need a fuel cell. We already discussed the history of the fuel cell originally invented by William Robert Grove, but there are much more modern versions of these. How exactly do they create energy from water? Water is a molecule that consists of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. It takes energy to separate water into oxygen and hydrogen, and energy is released when they are put back together as water. A fuel cell puts hydrogen and oxygen back together in a way that it releases the energy in form of electricity. This basic chemical reaction happens in every fuel cell, no matter where you use it. So now that I'm starting to understand exactly how hydrogen creates energy and how that energy is used by my car, I'm starting to get a sense of exactly how important hydrogen could be to power our entire society. Germany and EU already announced that they will go for hydrogen society. And they have made a specific targets, they made specific organizations, and I think 2020 is the starting year of Hydrogen Society and I'm very excited. There is no doubt that hydrogen will play an important role in the society of the future. Hydrogen is already being used in the mobility sector. 
coexisting with full battery electric cars. Hydrogen will be a very important part of our future energy solution as we work to move away from fossil fuels. So does hydrogen fit into our society? Can it replace all the fossil fuels we use today? If we want to use green energies, we have to find a way to store green energy. Yeah, because where we've been getting our stored energy in the past is stuff like oil or coal. But if we're going to switch to renewables, how exactly are we going to store wind? And this is where green hydrogen comes into play. We know that we need to change the way we produce energy. The technology to produce green hydrogen is already here. And yet, we seem to be hesitant to implement those technologies. Climate change is a huge threat. So, what are we afraid of? We have been living in the oil industry too long. So we don't trust anything else. It's always easy if you look at our status quo and the technology we use to think that new technologies are inferior. And yes, hydrogen is like 10 years behind when you compare it to solar technologies. But we use it already in cars and trains and other places. People from first world countries tend to be focused mostly on their wealth and their personal issues. But climate change and global warming isn't a developed country problem. It's a global one for which we need global solutions. Exactly. I mean, it doesn't make sense if we cut all the emissions in the Western countries when you have the emerging countries still burning a lot of coal. What we really need is a clean, cheap, reliable, green source of energy in order to address our global issues. I believe hydrogen really holds a green key to our future where it can not only couple the hard to electrify sectors with green electricity, so industry and also the heat, but also provide energy independence and energy security to remote locations. I come from an island where everything you use on this island you need to import. This also includes your energy needs. And so if you think about relying on diesel, you have to import diesel that was not made nearby. So there was already the whole supply chain of how to make fuel, clean it, etc. And then it has to travel on a boat that is clearly not green, and then finally it makes it. So it's a very expensive and long travel to supply energy. So I see hydrogen as a solution to empower isolated communities and also developing countries to produce their own fuel on site solely with sun and water. Is it utopian to have a society that uses hydrogen as a main pillar of the energy production and storage? One starting point to create a better world is the use of renewable energies. There is no chance that we can produce the green hydrogen out of renewable energy resources within Germany, even with the offshore uh, possibilities we have. Also in the future we will have to import vast amounts of primary energy and this has to be green, decarbonized. Germany is investing billions in building up a sector for renewables. 
But is that enough to create a society that is not fossil fuel dependent? Professor Strasser says that Europe needs to do more. Experts agree that we will not produce enough renewable electricity to make all the hydrogen that we will need in Germany. So we will have to go to areas of the world where you have a lot of sun or a lot of wind, mm -hmm. maybe like North Africa, where we'll have the necessary solar power to produce the hydrogen via electrolysis. To sum this up, Germany won't be able to produce enough energy out of renewable resources in the near future. And the same goes for other nations, because they don't have the luxury of sun and wind all year long. I think there is a huge opportunity for any nation that has huge solar exposition to use this excess energy to convert it into a green gas that can then be used for um, so many different applications, but also that can be used at nighttime. So it's really 24-hour solar energy as a different kind of energy carrier. If countries that have an excess of sun and wind are going to produce hydrogen that can be exported, we have to find a solution to transport this green hydrogen. Today, we have a highly efficient system to transport crude oil. We are dependent on the oil-producing countries and the logistics. It will not be only one country that can and will build solar and wind farms, because it will be a reliable source of income for the state in the future. Now we need to develop the same efficient transport system for sustainable energies. What we need is a pipeline system. This is an old industrial gas pipeline that was used uh, in the last century. So there is a plan to transport hydrogen around Europe, retrofitting existing natural gas infrastructure. Yes, it's possible to add hydrogen into our normal natural gas pipeline system, but you only can do it to a certain percentage, so it's not the ideal solution. You are right, but it is cheaper to retrofit than to create an entirely new infrastructure for hydrogen. We have a very dense uh, gas grid in Europe. The natural gas influx, first from North Sea, countries like Norway and Netherlands, led to the fact that we have a very, very solid gas infrastructure. We know that most of these gas pipelines can be used for hydrogen with some retrofitting. The retrofitting is much cheaper than building a new pipeline. So it's a quarter and even less of the cost. And what we are doing at the moment is we are linking industrial clusters with these pipelines. So we use existing pipelines between industrial clusters and turn them into hydrogen clusters. And this will lead in the medium term also to clean corridors. That is our aim. The EU plan sounds promising. But to fill those pipelines with green hydrogen, you will need the help of companies that will produce this hydrogen. It may come as a surprise, but the old oil industry is a logical choice. Jan Petersen from Total Germany explains how his company sees the hydrogen revolution. The moment when we have a certain amount of hydrogen transported within Germany, then it makes sense to use the gas grids because they are already existing. And you can convert a usual natural gas grid into a uh, hydrogen grid, that's possible. And this is in fact what the grid operators are looking for because they are scared about their future as well. If no one is using natural gas anymore, what do we do with all that infrastructure? Mm. Because we've spent a lot of money in the infrastructure and it's the question of reuse the invested money. 
And we could turn this a clean corridor by feeding the existing pipeline infrastructure with hydrogen, possibly from Northern Africa, because the pipeline exists. So solar power hydrogen that comes through this pipeline. Is Shatsi Makarkis right? Can we really use existing pipelines for hydrogen? According to Linde, a company that specializes in building hydrogen pipelines, it can happen. Yes, there are natural gas networks in Europe and in Germany that reach right into homes and supply heating systems there. These can actually be used, at least in part, for hydrogen. That depends a bit on the materials used for the pipes during construction. There's also being examined whether natural gas networks that have been shut down can be revived in this way. On our journey so far, we've learned about how green hydrogen can play an important role in our overall societal infrastructure. But there's one place where hydrogen is already playing a role, and that's the transportation sector. And now when most people hear the word electromobility, they think of electric cars, specifically uh, battery electric vehicles. They're not wrong. These will play an important role in our future mobility. They're completely emission-free, suitable for most people's daily mobility needs in urban areas. But for frequent trips with long ranges, there's a better solution. Fuel cell electric vehicles. We just heard Albert Biermann. He envisions a future of hydrogen cars and trucks roaming around on our streets. So how far are we away from this future? You have to have three things to make an industry revolution. One is the communication, energy, and then the mobility. So in the first industry revolution, there was printing, and newspapers, the energy was coal, and the mobility was a steam engine. And the second industry revolution was with telephone, radio, and television. The energy was oil, and the, the transportation media was the vehicles with internal combustion engine. Now we are ready for third industry revolution because we have renewable energy, solar, wind, and we have 5G internet, IoT, new communication system. And now we have powertrain like fuel cell and battery. We are in the situation of beginning of third revolution and everything will change. This industry revolution comes once in 100 years. And a place we're already starting to see this third industrial revolution come into play is in Switzerland. Here, private companies are working to revolutionize the transportation sector, starting with hydrogen trucks. And the state is getting behind this hydrogen feature by imposing a road tax on diesel and fossil fuel trucks. You know, we speak of Europe, Germany, preparing plans and programs for the future at the government level. But I think Switzerland is already doing it on a complete private level, and it worked extremely well. The whole starting point was this association. They brought companies together which are really seriously in competition. But they said, we want to establish a, a hydrogen ecosystem and we have to do that together. Because if everyone does it by himself, it's never ever going to happen, right? Because the whole infrastructure needs to come with that. That's an expensive piece of the puzzle. So it's not worth it doing it for one truck or two trucks. What is it about Switzerland that makes it so favorable for hydrogen? Is it the 
fact that there is so much running water that as a natural resource, Switzerland is able to make a lot of green hydrogen? Or is it the fact that they had a lot of foresight and were able to implement a lot of rules and regulations that made hydrogen technology very favorable? I think one of the most asked questions is why does it work in Switzerland and not in other European countries? I think the Swiss business case is special because um, there's, there's a road tax which was established about 20 years ago and um, you're, you do not have to pay this road tax if you're running an emission-free truck. We're talking about quite some significant money here. We're talking about 60,000 euros around about per year per truck. And since we're not selling the vehicles, we're utilizing a pay-per-use model. That means that in this fee per kilometer, everything is included. I mean, from service and after sales and spare part availability, insurance and so forth, but also the hydrogen itself. So we're really going down to the cost per kilometer. And we can factor in that this tax is not to be paid so that the cost per kilometer is the same. And then another advantage beside this road tax um, exemption is, is higher diesel costs in Switzerland compared to other European countries. So the benchmark we need to meet is higher than in, let's say, Germany or so. So Switzerland has moved towards green hydrogen without government subsidies. And I think that this is a really important thing to kind of emphasize that it can happen without direct government support. Yeah, the problem is to make the new technology as efficient as the old one. I mean, the old one has like 150 years time to get this cost efficient. We worked on it for, for such a long time. So now we have to do the same with new technology, which takes time, of course. So in order to move societies to green technologies, businesses need to stop polluting. And to do that, they need the incentive that it's too expensive to do business the way they have been in the past. And a CO2 tax is a great step in that direction. Absolutely. It will not help if we do it in only in Germany or in Europe. The best way would, would be let's say the level of G20, so the major countries uh, on, the, on the planet which uh, need to agree on a, on a CO2 price for the whole planet so that uh, it doesn't matter where you are producing, for example, fertilizers, you have to pay the same CO2 price and then uh, everybody yeah, has the same price level to reach when it comes to their products. The regulatory framework to enable business models for green hydrogen, one of the key measures is um, uh, to impose a price on CO2. This is the key to almost everything. Because running a truck on fossil fuels is still too cheap. As our experts pointed out, we need to introduce a price on CO2 emissions because burning fossil fuels has secondary costs, which means in the end, we have to make fossil fuels more expensive. As we have seen here in Switzerland, there is a viable business case for hydrogen. Hydrogen trucks can transport goods as cheap and quick as other trucks. So is this also a solution for passenger cars? Passenger car side and the commercial vehicle side, they, they both need each other. Because, as you said, it's, it's easier to emotionally connect with the passenger car segment and the design and, and so forth. And also the volume is much higher on passenger car side. So scalability, I think, comes from the passenger car side. Let's say for fuel cell systems, right? From a scalability perspective, we need the passenger cars as well to bring down the price. But when you look at the infrastructure, as I explained earlier, it's easier to build up the infrastructure if you're going for vehicle segments which with a much higher hydrogen consumption. And that's truck and bus. So now we have developed the technologies far so far that we can easily use it in the passenger cars. And we can use it in the trucks and ships 
And maybe in some day when we have a more power density, we can even use it in the aircraft. Hydrogen and fuel cells make perfect sense for cars and trucks. And as we've seen here in Switzerland, there's a viable business model without government support. Yeah, I mean, the shift in mobility will not happen without battery or hydrogen. It just depends on which kind of technology you want to use in which kind of circumstances. But I think this is important to know that in the logistics sector, you won't have a greener solution without hydrogen. I think that for long haul and distances, hydrogen really has the correct energy efficiency and density to really handle this sector. Yeah. But I have burning questions, Don. Beyond the mobility sector, is hydrogen a viable solution to power whole cities? Can we actually use hydrogen to power our homes? And how does hydrogen, as a green energy solution, work in emerging countries with less industrial infrastructure? Imagine you live in a house that's not connected to the grid, that there are no power lines, yet nothing has changed. You still have internet, heat, hot water. The only difference is now you're producing and using your own power. Does that sound like something from the future? Well, it's not. It's here today, thanks to hydrogen. The Fiswa House is a 100% self-sustaining home. It has energy-efficient architecture, produces its own energy via solar, and converts any excess power to hydrogen. The property is also designed to collect water, which it cleans and filters. Home Power Solutions is a startup in Berlin. The founder's goal was to create a totally energy-independent home like the Fiesma House. A battery is a perfect short-time energy storage and a power reserve. Actually, a battery is not such a good energy storage if you need to store bigger amounts in a longer period of time. Hydrogen has a typical characteristic it is actually quite cheap to store energy in hydrogen on the one hand, but the operational costs with hydrogen are higher. On the other hand, the, the costs of a battery are higher in the capex and the invest you have to take, but then on the operational side, it is cheaper. So we have certain amounts of energy that need to be shifted over a short period of time. This is perfectly done with batteries. But if you need to store higher amounts of energy about a longer period of time, hydrogen is the ideal solution. The reason it makes sense to use hydrogen to store energy that you create from your home is that if you wanted to store all the energy that you needed to, say, survive most of the winter, you'd need a second home for all the batteries that you'd need to store that energy. Electricity is used on the one hand directly to supply the house, which is actually the best because every energy storage in this world has efficiency and costs money. So it would be perfect if we could use the energy directly. But of course, we want the energy also in the night time or in the winter, so we store the energy for these times. We store them in batteries on the one hand. And the very special thing about our system, we also store the energy seasonal-wise in hydrogen, and we do that via the electrolyzer. And the electrolyzer takes the clean energy from the sun, takes water, produces hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen is stored um, for the winter time. In the winter time, when there's not enough sun, we use the carbon-free produced electricity actually from the summertime. So we've seen that hydrogen can power a home, but can it power a city? 
And if it can take on powering that city, Don, can it take on creating that city out of hydrogen? And I mean industry and steel production, like physically creating the city. Yeah, that's a huge task for the energy companies. I mean, they have to produce enough renewable energies to give that to the industrial clients. This is really complicated for them and they need strategies. That's why we decided to drive to Hamburg to understand firsthand how energy companies are offering hydrogen as a viable energy alternative in the industrial sector. In Hamburg, we spoke to Oliver Weinmann. Weinmann is managing director of Vattenfall Europe, one of the largest energy companies in the world. He spoke to us about the steps they are taking towards industrial decarbonization. We are developing new projects where we can enter into this hydrogen business. We did in, in the past, we did some research, some early developments, and uh, we built, built the first hydrogen filling station here in Hamburg some 10 years ago with an electrolyzer. And now we want to step into business. So it's in a larger project um, um, with, with more customers and, and uh, different branches, different sectors where we want to, to supply the hydrogen. We have one project in, in Sweden which is called Hybrid. It is a green steel project where Vattenfall is involved. In the north of Sweden, there are huge capacities on steel production. The first project we started is fossil-free steel. The main steel factory in northern Sweden and a mining company. Here we built up the first demo plant, which was put in operation two weeks ago. Sweden itself has a very ambitious target on getting the country VO2 free in, in, in the future. They have a focus now on industrial decarbonization and we are part of this process. This is an interesting glimpse into the future, but it's just one factory in Sweden, and it's done by a private company. We need to do more to transform the industry, which means that the governments have to step in. The good news is, some nations have already a plan in place to drive their society away from fossil fuel-based energies. One of the things you may have heard a bit about is the Green New Deal in Korea. And it's a plan to achieve a carbon zero society by 2050. That's not only about promoting clean energy solutions, but of course it has the added benefit of also creating jobs and fostering uh, zero emission solutions on an industry scale. On the other hand, of course, for us, it supports our zero emission initiatives here in Europe. So exciting stuff, and we're very happy to, to hear about this uh, Korean Green Deal. Hydrogen can transform a whole industry and make it sustainable. But what about one city? One village? or even one family somewhere in the world? What about areas where families don't have access to the electrical grid? Hydrogen is already helping people here and in their everyday life. I can report of some discussions that we have with a Berlin startup company that want to put in place electrolyzers, selling electrolyzers in Africa, uh, basically offer this electrolyzer together with hydrogen-powered kitchens and heating plates. Because currently people use still carbon-based heating materials. This would be a way to improve ordinary people's life from moving from this carbon-based uh, heating materials for their everyday cooking purposes to a hydrogen-based one. The company Professor Strasser is talking about is called Boreal Light. And we visit the founder of this company because he has a groundbreaking vision to make everybody's life a little bit better by using hydrogen.
I myself, I had also this problem, access to clean water also when I, when I was a child. So that's why it was something that I saw we have to change it. And then we start developing on this device. And two, thousand, two years later, we end up with the first solar, completely solar-based desalination system. What we are doing, we, we are taking any kind of water, polluted water, salt water, sweet water, we desalinated it, we clean it with UV, with sand filter, with carbon filter, so at least you have drinkable hygiene water. Water is an expensive good and not always readily available. If hydrogen is going to have a future, it can't use the water people need to live. If we can reuse wastewater to provide cheap drinking water, then we can use the same technology to produce clean water for hydrogen. Mr. Alal Hakim has found a way to use wastewater to make affordable drinking water that can also be used to make hydrogen. The normal 20 liter, uh, you can have it in the supermarket in uh, the cities like Nairobi, Mombasa for four to five dollars. We are selling this amount of water for one dollar in the cities and in villages we are selling 20 liter of water for 10 euro cents. So it's one fourteenth of the normal prices. Making hydrogen from wastewater is part of a growing trend of making hydrogen from waste. Some are calling this white hydrogen, which is even more interesting when you learn that it can be made from non-recyclable plastic. There might be a debate around climate change, but there cannot be a debate around the plastic Armageddon that we are currently facing. It is possible for hydrogen to replace fossil fuels on every level of society, in cities, in industry, in cars, in homes, and even in remote areas where they, so far, had to rely on fossil fuels. One thing that became clear to me over this hydrogen discovery series, it was kind of a mental leap for me to realize that we're using energy that's already stored in the earth, that it's something that's already created. And now we've had to make the move to creating that stored energy. Exactly, but we have put the infrastructure in place with the solar farms and the wind farms and everything. So what do we have to do now is to add on to this infrastructure... With hydrogen. With hydrogen. Think of the offshore wind parks in Germany. These are huge wind turbines and they operate maybe one or two miles offshore. Not all of them are actually connected to the grid uh, currently, so they're running producing electricity and nobody's using it. The idea would be in those locations to actually install electrolyzers to turn that fairly cheap renewable electricity into hydrogen. The resources we have today are not being used to their full potential. Hydrogen can step in here and it can focus on those parts of society that need large amounts of power. What we need from the government is a very ambitious environmental regulation. Because if we are honest, what do we observe? We observe that it is still absolutely legal to pollute. We can put CO2 in the atmosphere, we can put toxic particles in the lungs of the citizens. It is allowed. Imagine a regulation that will not be so complacent, regulation that would be much tougher in terms of environment, 
This would push the electric mobility, battery or hydrogen driven cars and trucks everywhere. And this will be the best signal that governments could give in order to really promote clean mobility. We've all experienced it. How hard is it to break a bad habit? And what about making a fundamental life shift? Now imagine changing the entire energy sector. We're not just talking about a little change here or there, but a massive shift in the way that we produce and consume energy. In medieval time, they said, we need to think seven generations in advance. So everything we politically decide, every step we take will have long during consequences. This is the case for hydrogen as we have, unfortunately, not electrified the world in the 20s of the last century. We knew about hydrogen already, but oil, gas were cheaper. We failed to do something for our next generations. If we want to do the energy shift, we have excess energy, which is extremely cheap, produced from renewable energies in certain times of the year. But it does not help to load electrical car in the winter time or in the night time. So we need to shift it. We need a solution for this task. And again, this is hydrogen. Creating a hydrogen society is all about fostering an ecosystem of renewables. And in order to do this, we need governments to change and act and focus on renewable energies. And our strategy is to create an entire emission-free ecosystem. We want to connect the dots and offer integrated eco-mobility solutions in almost all areas, not just mobility, also for maritime applications, energy storage, hydrogen generation and so on. Hydrogen has the potential to work in many areas. It's a misconception to think that hydrogen is only for cars. We will need hydrogen for sectors that are now heavily dependent on fossil fuels, like ships, trains and airplanes. We will also need to shift power-hungry industries like steel and cement away from coal and nuclear power so we can really achieve a green society. But having access to green energy is also important for our everyday life. From the first day, I was working with renewable energies and highly motivated to deliver energy to enable the people to take their own choice and to have an influence on their everyday life. I think what Mr. Abul Ella is saying here is extremely important. It's about you and me and how we are consuming energy. I think producing green hydrogen is the future. In some several years, if we can show successfully that this uh, model can work, it will be a game changer. The people, they will use this hydrogen system and I think it's also for the environment, also for the economic, it will be a game changer. Don, we've learned so much. And I think my biggest takeaway is that a carbon emission future isn't in the future. It's a possibility that's here today, right now. Exactly, and cars are only the beginning. We have buses, trucks, planes, ships coming, and they will create a holistic infrastructure with green and renewable energies. I'm Nicole Scott, and this is Don Dahlman. And even though we have to say goodbye for now, we don't want to stop our journey here. We want to keep on looking at how we can change our lifestyle to be more green and sustainable using hydrogen. And we are convinced now that hydrogen will have a huge impact for all our future.